everybody doing? You had a good day on Wednesday? You didn't mind that I, I, I let you out of class? And you're probably saying, what, what, will he do it today? And the answer is no, he won't. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, this weather is incredible. It's just so cool to uh, have it last. The forecast I saw was that Tuesday was going to be the last good day, and then every day I wake up and it lasts another day, so it's good. But now the weekend's here, it'll probably all go away. So, All right, so um, first of all, I apologize that the video that I have for you uh, to watch has a camera sort of mispointed. So I'm going to very briefly go through some of the things that's in that video. I'm not going to uh, go in, say much in detail, but I thought I would at least have the things projected, and I'll say a few words about them uh, so that we can kind of get up to speed with everything else. Um, in this chapter, in this lecture, what I'm doing is really introducing uh, structural considerations of nucleic acids. So structural considerations are important because it was the structure of DNA, of course, that gave us all the clues to um, how it actually worked. Okay? So that was what Watson and Crick did. And interestingly enough, uh, yesterday was the 60th anniversary uh, of the uh, publishing of the, the landmark paper of Watson and Crick describing the structure uh, of DNA. As I um, have told many people, and I'll tell you guys as well, Watson and Crick stole the data. They, they admitted it. They stole the data basically from uh, the most prominent female scientist of her day, Rosalind Franklin. Um, and they didn't steal it directly from her. They were given the data by her mentor. And this was at a time when um, women, unfortunately, were taken advantage of or not respected for their work in uh, laboratories. And um, that uh, there's, there's a very interesting story about Rosalind Franklin, which I won't have time to go into here. I usually tell my class. But um, it was her data that they took that made um, the structure of DNA uh, possible. Um, and interestingly, uh, Rosalind Franklin died before she could receive the Nobel Prize. Uh, you can't get the Nobel Prize uh, after you have, have died. She died before she could receive the Nobel Prize, so Watson Crick and her mentor, who gave them the data, received the Nobel Prize. Um, and one of the things people don't know about her is that she um, uh, probably died because of the way that they did the investigations in those days. She was the premier, one of the premier uh, biophysicists of her day. Um, and to determine structures of things, you have to shoot x-rays through them. And in those days, they did not um, have shielding for the machines. It was a macho thing to go and get blown away by the x-rays. And true, true story. Um, and she died of a fairly rare cancer that probably was brought on by the fact that she was exposed to a lot of x-rays. So it's a sad story. OK. Um, well, as I said, I want to flick through these fairly quickly. Uh, a lot of these are things I think you've had in basic biology classes before. You know, of course, that DNA has four bases, and RNA has four bases. And they overlap with three of the bases. Um, DNA has thymine, and RNA has uracil. The pyrimidines include the three that you see on the top here. The, the purines include the two that you see on the bottom there. And you see the, the pyrimidines are small, one ring. The purines are large. They have two rings. Okay? Um, purine is paired with pyrimidine. G goes with C. A goes with T. A goes with U. OK. Nucleosides are what result when you connect a base to a sugar. Okay? The sugar that you connect it to is either ribose, which is what you have for ribonucleotides that make up RNA, or deoxyribose, which is what makes up deoxyribonucleotides that make up DNA. Okay? Um, so we see two of the components of a nucleotide. A nucleotide has three things. It has a base, it has a sugar, and it has a phosphate. You don't see any phosphate on here. So something that only has a base and a sugar is known as a nucleoside. So we see two different nucleosides here. Nucleotides, of course, as I said, have a base, a sugar, and at least one phosphate. So these are all uh, nucleoside monophosphates. And notice it's a nucleoside monophosphate, meaning it's a nucleoside plus a phosphate. So if I say nucleoside monophosphate, that's the same thing as a nucleotide. So as I said, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because I did cover this in the uh, lecture, but I just want you to see some of the stuff that was actually on the screen. Um, the nucleotides are joined together in what are called phosphodiester bonds. And phosphodiester bonds, you can see one down here at the bottom, linking where a phosphate is the bridge between two different sugars. Okay? So this is a polymer that makes up RNA. And we can 
can see one sugar, this is a ribose, and it's linked over here to this guy, which is linked up here to this guy, which is linked up here to this guy, etc. That phosphodiester bond is what we call the backbone of DNA. Inside to all of that are the individual bases, which is what people think about when they think about nucleotides, but in fact the nucleotide contains bases, sugars, and phosphates. The um, double helix of DNA is something that probably grade school kids know about now. Um, it consists of a double helix that has what people describe as a large groove and a small groove. The large groove is this big gap here. and The small groove is this smaller gap here. And so when we look at the uh, overall structure, we see big, big gap, small gap, big gap, small gap, big gap, small gap. Major groove, minor groove, major groove, minor groove, major groove. Okay. Inside of there are the bases. The bases are on the inside of the double helix. This was a mistake Linus Pauling made when he was in the race to discover the structure of DNA. He thought the bases would be on the outside. It's one of the few mistakes Linus ever made. It was a big mistake because the bases tend to be fairly nonpolar. Well, if you think about it, what you've learned from protein structure, the nonpolar amino acids are on the inside of the protein, not on the outside. And the bases in DNA are on the inside, not on the outside. In fact, on the outside, that's where your charged groups are. You see the phosphates. See all these negative charges out here? They interact better with water. So the structure of DNA is, though it's um, a totally a fibrous-like structure, um, has some characteristics like that of a protein in, this, in the arrangement of polar and nonpolar things. They don't have much in the way of things that, that make um, uh, interactions with water compared to phosphates. Phosphates are charged, and the bases themselves are not charged. Okay. The bases do make hydrogen bonds, so in that sense, they could they, they do make some inter they could make some interaction with water, but they don't make as much as a charged group like a phosphate would make. Okay. Well, the bases um, are oriented with each other so that they make hydrogen bonds with each other, and it's these hydrogen bonds that actually help hold the double helix together. So we see here uh, an AT base pair. And I can tell it's an AT base pair. No, you don't have to know the structures of these guys, just like the amino acids. You don't need to know the structures. You do need to know which ones are purines, which ones are, are pyrimidines. Um, and you should also know that an AT base pair only has two hydrogen bonds. Two hydrogen bonds. Those two hydrogen bonds um, are obviously critical because they help to align and they help to hold the DNA together. But they're not as strong as the three hydrogen bonds that hold together um, a, a GC base pair. Okay? Three bonds are harder to break than two bonds, and we'll see soon when we talk about transcription that that actually has some very important characteristics. So AT bonds, uh, the hydrogen bonds between ATs are easier to break than the ones between the GCs because there's only two of them, whereas there's three of the G between the GCs. Okay. Now, there are three forms of DNA that predominate in cells. Okay? One form is called the A form, one form is called the B form, and one form is called the V form. Now, these guys are interesting in the way that the helices are arranged with respect to each other. And as I mentioned on the video, it's a little hard to describe that. And in fact, I will tell you that's not the easiest thing to see and how that goes. So I'm going to describe it to you in words. You don't really need to know anything you're not going to have to draw a structure, for example, but I, I think it's kind of interesting to, to understand a little bit about what's with these guys. So until I studied DNA, I never really realized that you can take two helices and you can wind them up in two different ways, okay? In two different ways. They're called left-handed and right-handed. And some people think, well, if you take the one and you turn it upside down, you get the other, and you don't. You turn it upside down, you still have it. They're oriented the same way. The way it goes is if we follow how our hand traces the back of the helix, okay, we can see if it's left-handed or right-handed. Right? Now, you're not going to see it here. If you really would like to see it, come to my office and I'll show you on a phone cord how you can tell the difference between a left-handed and a right-handed helix. But suffice it to say, if I grab my hand with the middle one, which is the B form, the B form is the most common form of DNA that we find in cells. It was the form that was found by Watson and Crick. And it is a right-handed form. My hand would literally grab the back of that, and my fingers would trace the back of that. Notice how my hand is going here, and it traces the backbone of the 
backside of that double helix. My left hand, by contrast, does not. It crosses it. Okay? Now, the A form is also a right-handed form of DNA. And it was the A form of DNA that was discovered by Rosalind Franklin. She actually published in the same issue of Nature the structure of the A form of DNA when Watson and Crick published the B form. The A form wasn't considered to be, at the time, very important. And in fact, people thought it was an artifact, meaning that it uh, was not something that was naturally found inside of cells. It's an odd-looking structure. It's more compact, you can see. It's also right-handed. It's a little even harder to tell it on that, that it's right-handed. But today we know that the A form does, in fact, form inside of cells. Okay? The Z form was one that came out of the blue. Uh, in the late 70s, um, a, a, a scientist named Alex Rich at MIT was uh, studying crystals of DNA. That's the way you, you, you get structures. You make crystals of things. And he pops up and discovers a very unusual structure that nobody had anticipated. It was a structure in which the helices were wound in the other way. It's what he described as left-handed. And you're definitely not going to see it there. But if you put your hand against the back of it, you, you could actually be able to trace that. And people thought, well, how in the world can left-handed DNA exist? Because we know that B form of DNA is predominating inside of cells. That would mean that something would have to go for a distance and then untwist and then twist back. And they said, there's no way. So Rosalind Franklin's A form of DNA was considered to be an artifact. Alex Rich's Z form of DNA, people said, totally artifact. No way, Jose. Okay. Well, it turned out that the Z form of DNA was later shown to exist in cells. And it probably has some functions relating to flagging where genes are. Probably does. Okay, now I'm not going to go into that, but there's some very interesting work that's been done uh, to show that. So all three forms exist inside of cells. You might wonder, what, what does the A form do inside of cells? I didn't say much about it. The A form, as you can see, actually puts a little bit of a bend into the DNA. A little bit of a bend. And I told you the story, I think, on the first day of class, that if you take all the DNA in your cells and you put it end to end, it's seven feet long. You've got to find some way to wrap it up and to coil it up in there. And it's thought that the bending that's provided by the A may actually help the DNA to do that sort of compaction that needs to make it uh, fit inside of cells. Um, so that's the A form of DNA. OK. Um, left-handed versus right-handed. So left-handed is Z. Right-handed is A and B. So that's the difference there. I'm not going to talk about flipping to A and Z. And I'm not going to talk about, I will just briefly talk about sequence flag. Okay? I'd like to show you this figure. It's kind of cool. All right? You see on the left a closed circle of DNA. Closed circle meaning it has no ends. And when we look inside of bacteria, what we discover is that bacteria have DNA arranged in circles. Completely arranged in circles. Our cells have DNA linear. Our chromosomes are linear. They have ends. Okay, the ends turn out to be really interesting. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But bacteria have circles. And if you ever play with a rubber band, and you grab one thing in the middle of the rubber band, and you take the other side, and you start twisting, 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 you see what happens with the rubber band. It gets all coiled up. That's a simple way of understanding supercoiling. Because if you were to take and cut one of these strands, and sort of wrap it around or unwrap it around, it would do exactly the same thing. And that's what you see pictured on the right. It's called supercoiling. Supercoiling changes the way that the DNA um, circle appears. And you can see that in this thing on the right, it's actually smaller. This guy is fitting into a smaller space. And bacteria turn out to have a very, very tiny environment in which they, they house their DNA. This may have some function in helping the DNA to fit inside of a bacterial cell. And the other thing that we see with supercoiling that happens is that this guy, these guys are really under some strain. Okay? Now, that's biophysics, so we're not really going to go into why the, or what the nature of the strain is. But suffice it to say that they're under some strain. 
there's some pressure, kind of like that pressure that existed when I was twisting that strand um, on the rubber band. Okay? Well, what happens when you put something under strain? A couple things can happen. One is it can go and do this. The other is to try to relieve that strain, it can try to, the, the, the strands in another portion of the DNA may unwind. That is, the base pairs may start to separate. And that turns out to be something really interesting with respect to um, control of DNA replication and control of transcription. We won't worry about that right now, but you will see that later. So I'm reminding you right now that this, this strain that I'm describing to you provides a way for cells to essentially open up interesting regions of double helix. Okay, I know I'm going fast here, but like I said, I just want to show you what these things look like. Okay, bacteria have small uh, uh, DNAs, okay? Bacterial DNAs will be on the order of about a million to maybe 10 million base pairs, okay? The human genome, humans are more complex, human genome has about 7 billion base pairs, roughly a thousand times as much DNA as a bacterium has. The DNA in a human cell is compacted into a nucleus that isn't much larger than that of a bacterium. So there's a lot of compaction, a lot of squeezing down that's got to happen in order to get that guy to fit into the nucleus of a human cell or of any animal or plant cell. And no, humans don't have the largest genome. There are some organisms, I think the lamprey is one, that have, that have DNAs that are 100 times larger than ours. Okay? Pretty amazing. Well, to fit these guys in, eukaryotic cells uh, use proteins to coil them up. Okay? They use proteins to coil them up, and the proteins are known as histones. Histones form nice little ball or circular type things like you see here, and the DNA actually wraps around the histones, as the way you can see here. The complex of DNA wrapped with histones, this overall thing is called chromatin. And chromatin is essentially, if you want to think about it on a large scale, what a chromosome is. Okay? So a chromosome is just a big batch of chromatin. That's all it is. So when people talk about chromosomes, students tend to think they're talking about DNA, but in fact chromosomes are comprised of both DNA and histone proteins. There's a lot of histone proteins that fit into chromosomes. Okay. These individual balls you see here, this little each one, you see it's labeled a nucleosome, one of those balls wrapped around is called a nucleosome. So one ball is a DNA has some interesting properties um, that, um, again, parallel what we talk and think about with respect to proteins. With proteins, we have, um, if we take and we heat up a protein, I said we would denature the protein, meaning they would unfold, and it wouldn't assume its proper shape. With DNA, DNA will also do the equivalent of unfolding, we call it denaturing, and this simply means that the strands will come apart. Strands get pulled apart. Well, this turns out to be a very useful for some laboratory techniques that I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay? But this pulling apart of the strands allows one to take a duplex and make two single strands out of it. And it ha how do we do it? We do it with heat, just like we do with proteins. Because remember that heat will break hydrogen bonds, and it's the hydrogen bonds that's holding together the double helix. Hydrogen bonds are being broken as we're heating this guy up. What this is showing is that it turns out that when you take a DNA and convert it from a double strand into two single strands, it absorbs light differently. The double stranded one absorbs less light than the two single strands individually do. The single strands absorb a lot of light. So we can actually follow how much we are unwinding that helix by just measuring the absorbance as a function of temperature. So you see we get up to about 90 degrees and this guy has almost completely unwound. Okay.
this was, um, oh, where did I get this? I can't remember where I got this, but this, this was, you know, I like this drawing. Um, the hyperchromic, it's called the hyper, well, never mind, I didn't do any word about the effect. But you can see the double helix, you can see the double helix starting to come apart, and you can see the two individual uh, strands completely apart appear as a function of temperature. It's a real world, real scientists uh, actually doing that. Okay. The last things I'll talk about here are RNAs. And RNAs, of course, are related to DNAs. DNAs have as their sugar deoxyribose. RNAs have as their sugar within them ribose. RNAs are grouped into several different forms. Okay? We used to talk only about three different forms. All right? Transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, and messenger RNA. And that's what I'm going to do most of my talking about here also, because they are the predominant forms inside of cells. Okay. Transfer RNA is um, a molecule that I'll show you uh, structure in a bit that carries amino acids to the ribosomes for protein synthesis. Ribosomal RNA is, a, are, are, as its name implies, are RNAs that are components of the ribosome. The ribosome is the structure that makes protein, translates protein. Okay. And the messenger RNA, by the way, this is called tRNA, this is called rRNA, and this is called mRNA. The mRNA, or the messenger RNA, is an RNA that carries the information to be translated, that is, to be made into protein. The messenger RNA is made by being copied from the DNA. In fact, all these are copied from the DNA. But the, RNA, the messenger RNA is the component that carries the information for how to make protein. And we'll talk a lot more about that. These other guys, these small RNAs, small nuclear RNA, small interfering RNA, microRNA, are things that have been discovered in recent years that have very interesting functions in helping to control whether or not a given protein is actually translated. They help determine whether or not a given protein is actually translated. They turn out to be very useful tools because by manipulating these inside of cells, one can stop a protein from being made in those cells. And what that means is that if you're trying to study, let's say, the function of a protein in a cell, and you can stop the cell from making it, you can look and ask the question, well, how is the cell different? What is the cell doing now? And in doing so, understand what the function of that individual protein is. It's a very, very powerful and interesting tool. There are people who are interested in studying and ma manipulating these to do things like, let's say, stop certain genes from being made in cancer maybe stop certain viruses from being able to replicate inside of cells like HIV, a variety of things for which there may have be some very interesting medical applications down the line. Okay. And here's the, let's see, that's not really much of interest there. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, this is a schematic diagram of what a transfer RNA actually looks like. These guys are relatively small, a little bit over 100 nucleotides or about 100 nucleotides in length. They're a single RNA molecule, and you'll notice that this guy folds back on itself and makes base pairs within itself. These are all base pairs that are here. People describe this as a cloverleaf structure, although it's not technically a cloverleaf, almost a four-leaf clover in this, this case right here. Okay. The most important parts uh, of it are up here, okay? The three prime end of this guy is where an amino acid gets attached. An amino acid gets covalently attached at this end. And at the far other end, down here where it says the neuronal numeral two, that's a very important three nucleotide sequence that's down here, one, two, three, at the very end of it. It's called the anticodon. And I haven't told you what a codon is yet, so I'm telling you what an anticodon is before I talk about a codon. An anticodon is something that forms a base pair 
those three base pairs with a codon. So what is a codon? A codon is a three base sequence in a messenger RNA that corresponds ultimately to the incorporation of one amino acid. Now we'll talk about the process of translation later, so I'm just going to leave that definition kind of hanging there for you right now. But suffice it to say that the translation happens because this guy down here has three base sequence that corresponds exactly to which amino acid gets put on this end. So the same amino acid will always be on the three base sequence, on a tRNA that has the same three base sequence. And yes, there are many different tRNAs and they have different three base sequences. Which one, which amino acid they get corresponds to which sequence they have down here. We'll talk more about that in a bit. But this is the, it's called the anti-codon loop. So remember that a transfer RNA has the anti-codon within it. And we'll say more about that later. Okay. The last thing I'm going to talk about here, uh, or show you here, is a pretty remarkable structure. Okay. Ribosomal RNAs are the biggest, or well, it, it, I shouldn't say they're the biggest, but they're the, the, some of the bigger RNAs. Some messenger RNAs are bigger than this, but not all of them. Ribosomal RNAs are pretty good size. These guys are on the order of about 16, 1700 nucleotides. Just like the tRNA was a single strand that went around and made, folded back on itself, so too is the ribosomal RNA something that has two ends also. Here's the five prime end you can see right here. And look at all the unusual base pairing that's happening inside of this molecule, coming all the way around until we get over here to the three prime end over here. Why does it have such an unusual structure? Well, there's a couple reasons why it has an unusual structure. The ribosome, which is a structure that makes the proteins, has proteins itself. And these proteins probably arrange themselves on this, on this molecule. So this gives a scaffolding for making the overall ribosome structure. That's one thing that this guy does. Other thing that this guy does is it provides um, for, at least for one of the ribosomal RNAs, is they actually catalyze the formation of the peptide bond. Not all reactions catalyzed themselves are catalyzed by proteins, such as enzymes. Some reactions are catalyzed by RNA molecules called ribozymes, R-I, Z-Y-M-E-S, ribozymes, okay? This wasn't even known um, 15, or I shouldn't say 15, it wasn't even known hardly 20 years ago, okay? It's been in this time that we've come to understand the significance of what RNAs are doing. So the structure, this guy has, if we think about it, again, thinking about parallels to proteins, we thought of a protein being folded, and I told you that that folded shape of the protein was critical for its function. Well, look, this doesn't look too unlike folding. And its shape probably is critical for its function, which in some cases here is involved in catalyzing the formation of peptide bonds. Okay, I'm not going to talk about these guys down here. And I'm not going to um, go, go through that. That's pretty straightforward, I think, here. All right, questions about that? I'm sorry, can you say it again? Let me go back to the structure. The, the, the double helix of DNA you're saying? Here? 34 angstroms. That, that, that's a symbol for angstrom. It's a, it's a unit of length. A unit of length like a meter. Only this is 10 to the minus 10th meters. That's what that is. It's a, far, it's a farther distance. So this is going all the way down here. This is going part and then part, right? So this is the size of the, lar of the major group. This is the size of the minor group. 
for our purpose, it doesn't, it doesn't have any sense. Oh, shh, shh, shh. Say it again. The importance of measuring this, it just gives us the dimensions. That's all. Okay. Believe me, there are people who spend their whole lives worrying about these dimensions. We, we won't do that. So, okay. Okay. Let's um, turn our attention to something that's a little bit more interesting than simply structure, and that's the synthesis of DNA. Would you guys like to stop and sing a song first? Let's do that. No? How many would I say, yeah, we don't have to sing a song. How many say yes? How many say no? Lots of no's. All right, we'll, we'll wait. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Uh, we'll save the song for the end. Anybody who wants to sing at the end can sing at the end. How's that? All right. Replication. So um, when Watson and Crick published the paper, um, landmark paper of DNA, and by the way, I like to say this is one of the most interesting papers ever published. Uh, it was probably, I, I think, one of the most important papers of the 20th century. I think that, that that paper that they published was actually the densest um, amount of information that has ever been done in a scientific paper. If you think about the implications, what we know as a result of that paper has, has, has revolutionized all of biology. It's it revolutionized our lives, and it's going to continue to revolution our lives. Revolutionize our lives. That paper was one page long. One single page. There's not another scientific paper that I know of of that size that had anywhere near the implications of that paper. So, all right, let's start off talking about the central dogma, okay? The central dogma is a term that we use to describe the fact that when they first came across DNA and they're figuring out, well, what's going on, they knew that DNA was double helical. And they said in that very first paper that, well, the double helical nature of DNA suggests how it might replicate because one strand could tell how to make the other strand. That's what this is doing right here. But in the very first days, they really didn't know. They didn't know what was going on. They knew there were proteins, and they knew there were RNA, but they weren't really connected. That happened later. As they began to discover these processes, they realized that DNA gave the information necessary to make the RNA, and the RNA gave the information necessary to make the protein. That became known as the central dogma. You hear, talk to scientists today, and you'll hear, DNA makes RNA makes protein. That's what people say. Well, it, again, it wasn't until about the 1970s or early 1980s that people began to realize that this was not just a one-way path, but that, in fact, there were some things that went in the other direction. This process is called transcription, so when they found the reverse of the process, they called it reverse transcription. What that meant was DNA can make RNA, but if you have the right conditions, RNA can also be made back into DNA. Well, what are the right conditions? What does that mean? In our cells, okay, this phenomenon occurs only at the very ends of our chromosomes. Or it occurs if we've been infected with something like HIV. Because HIV is something that starts out as an RNA, and it has an enzyme called a reverse transcriptase, that we'll talk about later again, that converts the RNA into DNA. So reverse transcriptase is an important enzyme. It is uh, an enzyme that's found in what are called retroviruses, things that start out as RNA and somewhere during their life cycle get made into DNA. Okay. Well, we still don't know anything going backwards from protein to RNA, and it's unlikely we will have that. Okay. You see, RNA replication, what's that mean? Well, our cells never do this. But there are some viruses that exist as RNAs, and instead of going back through a DNA form, they just simply replicate themselves like this. Okay. Good example, flu virus. Flu viruses do this. Okay. Well, let's talk about DNA replication. We're not talking about RNA. We're talking about DNA replication. All right. 
this depicts what, uh, sort of schematically, what happens on the left in the replication of the circular chromosome. We call it a chromosome, by the way. The circular chromosome of E. coli, even though it doesn't have any proteins wrapped around it, we still call it the chromosome. The replication starts in a bacterial DNA in one place. It's called the origin. And it's also called an origin in eukaryotic cells as well. But in eukaryotic cells, you see that there's many of them. In a bacterium, it starts at one place. And then it spreads out what we call bidirectionally, where you can see it's actually going out like that. It will come all the way back around. And when it comes all the way back around, you will have two double helices of DNA where you only had one to begin. Okay? Two double helices where we only had one to begin. Turns out that's kind of cool. All right? You might say, okay, well, that's really nice. You spit off the, 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 the second double helix and now you've got two. But it turns out that there's a problem with doing that. Okay? The problem with doing it is this. Okay? When they replicate, they replicate and they end up being like this. The two circles of DNA are not separate from each other. They're interlinked like a chain. Okay? In order for the cell to divide, that is a bacterial cell to divide, these guys have got to be made into these guys. Otherwise, they can't get apart because the chain is holding them together. All right? Well, it turns out bacteria have an enzyme called a special kind of a topoisomerase. No, you don't need to know that. But it catalyzes a very simple reaction. The reaction it catalyzes, if you watch very closely, is this. And that's what it does. Now, I tell you that because there are antibiotics that people have designed that inhibit this enzyme from doing this. Therefore, you can kill bacteria because they can't divide. Kind of cool. So again, our knowledge about the molecular level, about how these things work, help us to do things with respect to human health. OK. Well, in our cells, we start out as, with linear chromosomes. And there's some real problems we'll see later with linear chromosomes. But the important thing here is that replication happens in a variety of places. We need to have a lot of origins because we've got a lot of DNA to replicate. This E. coli is remarkable at what it does, as we will see. It's incredibly fast. And even though ours is very fast as well, okay, ours has the advantage of having multiple origins, multiple places where the replication starts and ultimately gets down here looking like this guy here. OK. The enzyme that catalyzes the formation of DNA is called a DNA polymerase. Now, a DNA polymerase, and yes, I will slow down because now I'm getting into the stuff that I haven't gone through before. You've got everybody sitting there. It's Friday, Hearn, right? Okay, slow down. All right. A DNA polymerase is a really interesting enzyme. It's catalyzing a reaction, and it's catalyzing the formation of a new strand of DNA. And to make a strand of DNA, we have to join nucleotides together. What this guy is doing is, first of all, it's reading this strand over here. This is the other strand. It's reading, and it says, oh, here's an A. <coughs> Excuse me. So I need to put a T in a cross from it. I go up here and I say, OK, here's a G. I need to put a C across from it. But now I've got to join these two guys together. I've got to make a phosphodiester bond, because that's the backbone. And if you look carefully at the phosphodiester bond before, you saw that the phosphodiester bond only had one phosphate here. This guy has three phosphates here. This might be ATP. This might be CTP. In the formation of the, phosphate, uh, of the phosphodiester bond, this bond gets broken. This bond right here between this, these first two phosphates gets broken. The phosphate gets attached to the hydroxyl, and these two phosphates on the left go flying away. That's what happens thanks to DNA polymerase. 
Now, I'm describing it to you in words at a rate that's very, very slow. Okay? Very, very slow. It took me a while to tell you what this guy was doing. I'm going to I'm going to summarize. It reads. It grabs the right nucleotide to pair it. It makes a connection to the previous nucleotide. And we'll see later, it actually checks to see if it did its work right. It's called proofreading. Okay? And it moves on. Now, that process occurs in a bacterial cell at the rate of 1,000 nucleotides a second. A phenomenal rate. A thousand nucleotides a second. This guy is reading, grabbing, polymerizing, reading, grabbing, polymerizing, and moving physically along that double helix. It's absolutely remarkable what a DNA polymerase is doing. Not only is a DNA polymerase moving along at the rate of a thousand nucleotides a second, in a bacterial cell, that DNA polymerase is making about one error in every 10 million bases. One error in every 10 million bases. Now, I'd like for you to think about sitting down at your keyboard and typing at the rate of 1,000 characters a second, something that you are trying to copy, right? You're copying at the rate of 1,000 characters a second, and you only make one error every 10 million characters. It's mind-boggling, right? Can't conceive of doing that. That's what a, a, a DNA polymerase is doing. It's reading, it's making that, and it's moving on at the rate of 1,000 a second. Okay. Well, replication happens inside of cells. It's actually more than a DNA polymerase that that's involved in this. Okay? Replication happens at a specialized structure we call a replication fork. Replication fork. It's at the replication fork where we can see some things going on. Here's the strands that are being copied on the right, called the parental strands. And here are the products on the left that are being made. You can see in this color of this uh, overall thing that one strand is black on top, one black strand on the bottom. That means that the new DNAs are being made. Each one has one copy of the original two parental strands. You also see something interesting here, and that is that the top guy here has something called leading strand, and the bottom guy has something called lagging strand. And you'll notice that the leading strand is made in one continuous piece. And the lagging strand is made in a series of smaller pieces. This happens in all cells. Leading strand versus lagging strand. Well, why does that happen? The reason it happens, I'll slow down. The reason that that happens is because DNA can only be synthesized in one direction. It's called 5' to 3'. So to show you that, I need to go back and show you a nucleotide here. Okay? So here is, oh, sorry, wrong one. Here's a nucleotide. All right? You'll notice that this nucleotide has a sugar ring right here. That's what this guy is, is a sugar. And you'll see it has a 3, a 4, and a 5. Those are numbers of the carbons in there. This where my uh, uh, magnifying glass is would be carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? That tells us, first of all, that this guy is asymmetric. Asymmetric. Okay? This guy is being made from the topward direction moving down. This would be in here. The next nucleotide that would come in would be this one right here. Okay? This guy right here is coming in. That says that this end up here is what we call the five prime end, and this prime down, this end down here where the hydroxyl is, is the three prime end. 
This is always the way that DNA polymerase will be, DNA will be made. This is one of the few always in biology for which there are no exceptions. Always made in the five prime to three prime direction. Let's go back and look at this leading and lagging strand. The leading strand is very simple. It starts at the five prime end, it moves inwards. And by the way, the strands are what we call anti-parallel. I should point this out, all right? Anti-parallel means that a five prime to three prime on one strand is different than the other strand, which is the opposite orientation. See the three prime end is with the five prime end here. You see that the five prime end is with the three prime end here. They're oriented like this. They're not oriented like this. They're oriented like this. That's what anti-parallel means. So, not only does a strand be made in only one direction, but a strand can be oriented in only one direction. Very important. As replication proceeds, the leading strand starts off and says, oh, I'm, I'm copying in the opposite direction this strand over here, so I'm cool. I don't have to do anything but just keep copying, 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 copying. This guy down here doesn't have that luxury because replication has to proceed in the five prime to three prime direction, but that means it has to start here and go here. It has to start here and go here. Well, why does it do it in pieces? Well, in order for this strand to be copied, it has to be opened up. And it gets opened up by this one moving forward. So this moves forward a little bit more, and now a new region will open up. And when that new region opens up, bang. It's got to be copied again, five prime to three prime. So these are all happening, each five prime end that we see here, each one of these is happening because a new region opened up and the polymerase started to copy it. Now you might find that a little conceptually difficult. If you do, come see me. I'll be happy to explain it to you. But the upshot of it is that the lagging strand gets made in pieces the leading strand is made in one single shot. Good question. Are the lagging strand pieces about the same size on average? The answer is yes. Okay. Now, there are some very interesting videos online that show the process of DNA replication that I would recommend that you look at. There's some YouTube videos that are absolutely beautiful. You don't need to draw them or understand or, or, or do anything with it. But I think looking at the complexity involved in this, you'll learn a lot about, whoa, when we think about this thing going on at 1,000 nucleotides a second, okay, we realize, again, that at the nanoscopic level, things are happening in a very different way than they are in the macroscopic world in which we live here. Okay? Now, I'm going to leave you with one last thought, and then I will let you out in just one second. In order for this guy to happen, in order for this guy to move forward, replication's got to happen. DNA polymerase doesn't just push through here and make this happen. Next time I'll talk about proteins involved. But I want to tell you about one protein involved right now that's amazing. It's called a helicase, H-E-L-I-C-A-S-E. -E. If DNA polymerase is moving along at 1,000 nucleotides a second, Something's got to be unwinding the DNA at that same speed. Well, to unwind DNA, you got to basically be able to swivel and make things unwind very rapidly. 1,000 nucleotides a second corresponds to 60,000 nucleotides a minute. Okay? And if we have 10 base pairs per turn of DNA, that means that 6 thousand unwindings have to happen per minute. That means that the DNA helicase which is doing the unwinding is working at 6,000 RPM. 6,000 RPM. Mind boggling. Okay. Now, I'm going to stop there. If anybody wants to sing, we'll sing. If you don't want to sing, that's fine too. Um, and I will talk more about proteins next time. Here's the song if you want to sing. Okay.
ready? That term is almost at an end, 10 weeks since it began. I wondered how my grade was, because I did not have a plan. The first exam went not so well, I got a 63. It was just about the average score in biochemistry. I buckled down the second time, did not sow my wild oats. I downloaded the videos and took a ton of notes. I learned about free energy and delta G naught prime. My score increased by seven points, a C plus grade was mine. I sang the songs I memorized, I played the MP3s. I learned the citrate cycle and I counted ATPs. I had electron transport down in all of complex B. I gasped when I saw my exam, it was a 93. So heading to the final stretch, I crammed my memory and came to class on sunny days for quizzing comedy. I packed a card with info and my brain almost burned out. It was much to my delight, I got the A I dreamed about. So here's the moral of the song, it doesn't pay to stew. If scores are not quite what you want and you don't have a clue, the answers get into your head when you know what to do. Watch videos, read highlights, and review, review, review. All right, see you guys on Monday.